Already this morning we have sung a great hymn, and I want you to just remind yourselves about it so you can pull your hymn books out if you like. Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Anywhere he leads me in this world below. Anywhere without him, dearest joys would fade. Anywhere with Jesus, I am not afraid. If you didn't come to adult Sabbath school this morning, you missed it. Thank you, Diane. Great (coughs) exposition of the fact that with Jesus, we are living in the land of love. Without him, we are living in the land of fear. Two different words. Jesus came through, uh, the lesson this morning was about the sanctuary, and therefore we can sing anywhere with Jesus. I can safely go. So I thought I'd read you a story this morning. I'm going to give credit where credit is due. Dr. Seuss. And to think that I saw it on Mulberry Street. When I leave home to walk home, walk to school, Dad always says to me, Marco, keep your eyelids up and see what you can see. But when I tell him where I've been and what I think I've seen, he looks at me and sternly says, your eyesight's much too keen. Stop telling such outlandish tales. Stop turning minnows into whales. Now, what can I say when I get home today? Today. Because you see, today, we're talking about today. All the long way to school and all the way back, I looked and I looked, and I've kept careful careful track, but all that I've noticed, except my own feet, which meant he was looking down and not anywhere else, was a wagon and a horse on Mulberry Street. Oh, that's nothing to tell of. That won't do, of course, just a broken down wagon that's drawn by a horse. That can't be my story. That's, that's only a start. <laughs> I'll say that a zebra was pulling the cart. And that's a story that no one can beat when I say that I saw it on Mulberry Street. Yes, the zebra is fine, but I think it's a shame such a marvelous beast with a cart that's so tame. The story would really be better to hear if the driver I saw was a charioteer. A golden blue chariot, something to meet, rumbling like thunder down Mulberry Street. No, it won't do at all. A a zebra's too small. A reindeer is better. He's fast and he's fleet, and he'd look mighty smart on old Mulberry Street. Hold on a minute. There's something wrong. A reindeer hates the way it feels to pull a thing that runs on wheels. He'd be much happier instead if he could pull a fancy sled. You're getting into the rhyming, I know. You you like this one? I like this one. Hmm, a reindeer and a sleigh. Say, anyone could think of that. Jack, Fred, or Joe, or Nat. Say, even Jane could think of that. But it's, it isn't too late to make one little change. Just one little change, of course. A sleigh and an elephant. <laughs> There's something strange. I'll pick one with plenty of power and size, a blue one with plenty of fun in his eyes, and, and then just to give him a little more tone, I have a Raja with rubies perched high on a throne. Say, that makes a story that no one can beat when I say that I saw it on Mulberry Street. Do we have a Mulberry Street in Santa Clarita? Mm. But now I don't know. It still doesn't seem right. An elephant pulling a thing that's so light would whip it around in the air like a kite. But he'd look simply grand with a big brass band. 
A band that's so good should have someone to hear it, but it's going so fast that it's hard to keep near it. I'll put a trailer. I know they won't mind if, if a man sits and listens while hitched on behind. But now it's... But now is it fair? Is it fair what I've done? I'll bet those wagons weigh more than a ton. That's really too heavy a load for one beast. I'll give him some helpers. He needs two at least. So he puts... giraffes on either side. But now what worries me is this. Mulberry Street runs into bliss. Unless there's something I can fix up, there'll be an awful traffic mix-up. I take It takes police to do the trick, to guide them through that traffic thick. It takes police to do the trick. They'll never crash now. They'll race to top speed with Sergeant Mulvaney himself in the lead. The mayor is there, and he thinks it is grand. He raises his hat as they dash by the stand. The mayor is there, and the aldermen too, all waving big banners, red, white, and blue. And that is the story that no one can beat when I say that I saw it on Mulberry Street. With a roar and its motor, an airplane appears and dumps out confetti while everyone cheers, and that makes a story that's really not bad. But it still could be better. Suppose that I add a Chinese boy that eats with sticks, a magician doing tricks, a ten-foot beard that needs no comb. Uh, no time for now. I'm almost home. I swing around the corner and I dash through the gate and I run up the steps and I'm feeling simply great for I had a story that no one could beat. And to think that I saw it on Mulberry Street. But Dad said quite calmly, just draw up your stool and tell me the sights on the way home from school. There was so much to tell, I just couldn't begin. Dad looked at me sharply and pulled on his chin. He frowned at me sternly from there in his seat. Was there nothing to look at? No people to greet? Did nothing excite you or make your heart beat? Nothing, I said, growing red as a beat. But a plain horse and wagon on Mulberry Street. What's your story today? Many of you have, have taken the song that we have sung this morning, Anywhere with Jesus. You've taken it literally. And you've promised that you would tell people about it. You'd tell people uh, what on earth it is that you have seen as you have been walking in your life. Mulberry Street, Lyons Avenue, McBean, wherever life has taken you this week, maybe Highway 5, Highway 14. What did you see? What's your story? Was it just a, a broken down Mercedes? Or a junky old Toyota being patched up so that it could make one last trip back and forth between Lancaster and Encino? What's your story? You see, because, because we only have today, we only have today, we don't know about tomorrow. Now, we like to comfort ourselves by saying that we serve a God that knows about tomorrow, that has already been in tomorrow, and, and so therefore we can rest and relax in Him, but that resting and relaxing happens today. That Hebrews text that you heard, we'll refer to that in a moment, but it talks about the fact that today is the day of salvation. Today we know stuff tomorrow we don't know about. So what's your story? In the Bible, uh, Jesus tells us that we need to be prepared. We need to be prepared for what's coming and, and that he knows what's coming and he will let us know on a daily basis. So that's why I've entitled our time together today, Today, Not Tomorrow. 
Today, not tomorrow. If you turn in your Bibles, Matthew 24 begins this very interesting piece for us today. Jesus says in Matthew 24, verse 36, No one knows about that day or the hour, not even the angels of heaven. So as we call ourselves Adventists today, as we look forward with this, with this great anticipation based on our studies, for example, like again, I'm going to say if you didn't come to Sabbath school today, you missed out on a really, really good study that tells us not only about the past, but also about the future. That we have a great high priest who is leading us into that future, who stands beside his heavenly father. But if we were to ask Jesus today to tell us about when he is going to come back, what would he say? Today, what would he say? My father knows. But guess what? I don't, and neither do the angels. That's what he's just told us here. As it, is, as it was in the days of Noah, this is what we looked at last night at our breakfast for dinner, so will it be in the coming of the Son of Man. For the days before the flood, people were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage up to the day that Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. This is how it will be in the, in the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the hand mill, one will be taken and the other left. This is a very important text to individuals who believe in a certain uh, belief concerning those who will be taken before some of the rest of us. But verse 42 says, therefore, okay, he has said something about what is going to be happening at the time of the end. He hasn't said when it will be, but this is what will be happening. Hence, last night we said we really should be taking careful note of what was happening in the time of Noah. If you want to know about uh, what will be happening in the time of Jesus' second coming, we need to be knowing what was happening in the time of Noah. So that's why we were looking at that text last night. But he says, therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. The story is told of a man who was into archery. And... His neighborhood was being systematically burgled. Maybe it was one of those older neighborhoods that had windows in the door. Windows that might have been near to the lock in the door. So he did the calculation. He found that his house was very likely on the list of the burglar very soon. Night after night... Instead of sleeping in his bed, he sat opposite the door with his bow beside him. I don't know how much sleep he got, but he was watching. As with the other burglaries, he was awoken by the tinkling of glass, very quietly because the burglar had figured out how to break just enough of a pane of glass in the door in order to reach through and unlock the door because everybody had been locking their doors but the burglar would reach through unlock the door and let himself in take whatever he liked and leave very quietly in the night while people slept he did not expect what happened next the archer picked up his bow put in an arrow and shot the man through the hand, pegging him to the door. He next then picked up the telephone very seriously and, and, and without any excitement, called the police and said, I have your burglar. He's sticking around. <laughs> they caught the man because the house owner was ready. Jesus says, if if you know that your house is going to be burgled, 
You're probably going to stay around to make sure that it doesn't get burgled. You're going to do something about it. You're going to prepare. You're going to be on guard. It would seem that that is completely the opposite way that people were acting in the days of Noah. They did not understand why Noah was building the ark even though it took him 120 years. Yeah, they heard about it. Then they got used to it. And then they didn't care about it anymore. And they went about their business, the Bible says, doing the normal things that they would do. Marrying, giving in marriage, uh, going out to eat, you know, just business as usual, even though Noah is still building the ark. As, as Adventist people, as people who are looking into the future and saying, Jesus is coming soon, I'm just asking us as a congregation today, today, is this still your story? Is this still what you see when you traverse through your life? Are you still aware that Jesus is, is asking us to tell people in this world that he is coming soon and that he needs us to do it today, not tomorrow. Jesus goes on in this apocalyptic and tells us another story. It's a good one. And uh, it has to do with bridesmaids. Bridesmaids are such happy people who love to be around the bride. They're waiting and they're ready. Everything is just as it should be, except for one problem. You know, there's got to be a problem at a wedding. It's not a wedding unless there's a problem. <laughs> the problem is the bridegroom is late. This is Matthew 25, where we'll be dwelling for a few weeks here. Matthew 25, we find that these ladies are waiting with the bride for the bridegroom to come. You have probably been told many times this is, this is a scene of a Palestinian wedding and it could go on for a whole week. People needed to really be prepared for this. And the, the, the groom would come from his house and would come to the house of the bride and would take the bride back to his house. This, this sort of coming and going action is, is a little different in some respects to the way that we do it today because often uh, we, we see that young people already have their house that's separate from their parents' house. And so they, they get married and they're not bringing, the, the, the husband is not bringing the, the, the new bride back home to, to his parents' house. He's bringing it to his own, to, the, to his own house. So it's kind of different. But there they are, they're waiting. And um, let, let's just say uh, there are times when uh, things happen and we have to wait. We wait. And we wait some more. 1844 came around. And there were people who were waiting. They'd been told, mistakenly, that the prophecy was going to end. The 2300-year prophecy was going to end. And that Jesus was going to come back. They, they had thought that this idea that the earth was God's footstool meant that he was going to come back to earth at the end of this prophecy. Again, if they had studied the sanctuary message better, which they did later, they would have realized that this was not what was going to happen, that what actually happened was that there was a, a, a shift in the ministry of Jesus on our behalf. 1844 is significant. It's something we should know about. We should know why it was important. We should also know why 1888 is important. What happened at a general conference session in 1888 and what Ellen White said about that happening. You should know what happened then. 
and why Jesus decided not to come back to earth at that time as well. Readiness. Readiness. We're talking about the fact that we need to be ready today, not tomorrow. We need to have our relationship with Jesus intact today, not tomorrow. Notice something in the Bible? God doesn't talk a lot about tomorrow. He talks about today. The old Pathfinder uh, phrase, what should, we do, what should we be doing today? We should be going on God's errands. So the bridesmaids were on an errand. They were doing what they were supposed to be doing. But then the problem came that, that while they were doing what they were supposed to be doing, the bridegroom delayed. I don't, know how, I don't know how you feel about that, but here we are this people who have been saying for years, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming. I grew up with, with, with preacher grandfather and, and preacher father and other evangelists that, that if I were to name that many of you would know. And they would look around in, 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 in the world and they would say, see, see what's happening? This means that that Jesus must be coming very soon. And so this, this anticipation, this, this almost this anxiety would build up in me at times. And I would think, wow, you know, maybe I won't get to do this or maybe I won't get to do that because Jesus is going to come before I get to do it. I don't know if any, any of you relate to that kind of a sort of roller coaster ride of emotions. Being an Adventist all my life, you know, I've had plenty of time. I can remember being at camp meeting in 1972. Do you remember 1972? Some of you do. Some of you are saying, wow, he's really old. <laughs> the church put on a huge program called Mission 72. We're going we're gonna to get out there and we're going to tell the message and when we tell the message then our work will be done and Jesus can come home. A little book was read to us at that camp meeting called Now. Any of you ever remember that book? Now. It was all about a young couple who were running running for their lives because the Sunday law had come and and, and they were they were they, they were being hunted. People were, were, were knocking on each other and telling on each other and, and, and all the things that we had ever been told in fear about the second coming of Jesus was coming true in the book now. We sat there as juniors in rapt attention as this book was read to us at camp meeting. 1972. What's, what's this year that seems to be going so fast? We are now in May, folks. May, school is nearly done, right? Uh, uh, you know, it's, school's nearly done. I, I didn't hear any amens from, from anybody. School <laughs> is nearly done. Yeah. All right. Wow. We, we just started a few months ago, and now it's nearly done. School is nearly done. This, this year seems to be going by so fast, 2018, not 1972, 2018. Today is 2018. Today we can go on God's errands, but it seems that even though we are, and even though we're telling stories about it, we, we see it on Mulberry Street. There are all kinds of amazing beasts that we talk about in our story, isn't it true? but it's today. You know, the people of Israel had the same problem. They had the same problem in the sense that they had to wait. I don't know if some of you have read, but there are estimates that between the time that the Israelites left Egypt and the time that they got the Ten Commandments, and then after that, we're ready to go into Canaan the first time. 
was not very long, not even but a few months maybe at the very most, okay? And so they had to wait. And while they waited, their food ran out. Their food ran out and they started to do something that I have heard in this denomination, in this church, much of my adult life as well. It's called grumbling. Grumbling. These individuals had come with, with Moses and had decided that they were going to l go out and worship God. And guess what? They ran out of food. Let me ask you this. In your journey with God, has He ever let you starve? Okay. Has He ever uh, 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 made you so thirsty because you didn't have anything to drink? God actually brings His people to that point where they are having to completely and utterly depend on Him. What does he do? He sends flaky, flaky stuff called manna. Is it any wonder that we are known for cornflakes? Maybe that's what we thought was going to be the next manna. I don't know. But he sends manna. He actually listened to them when they said, you know, we wish we had the flesh pots of Egypt. What did he send? A bird named quail. So much that everybody had as much meat as they could eat, and then some, and they were so hungry, some of them, that they didn't even bother to cook it. And those people paid a high price. They, they paid with their lives for being so interested in, 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 in eating without cooking that they died. Interesting that in the process of providing for his people, God provides in such abundance that people overeat. Can you, can you overeat as a vegetarian? Are Adventists all skinny minis because they're vegetarian? I don't know. I have nothing against, uh, I have nothing against that stuff that comes in cans. In fact, I, I, I do like Vigilings. But... Maybe too much of a good thing is not good. In the process of giving them water, in the process of giving them food, he teaches them about Sabbath. And I can't skip over this because I have said this to you before, that we need to realize that Sabbath is God's way of teaching us to depend on him. The fact that you showed up here today, the fact that you have any idea of what Sabbath is all about, shows that you at least know that God has said that this is what you should do. Now I'm hopefully adding to your understanding of Sabbath by saying that when he taught it to the Israelites, who had been in slavery for 430 years, he taught it to them with food. So yes, today we're going to have potluck, and it's going to be the Adventist manna called haystacks. Okay, so please understand that, 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 that you can stay for lunch and God has provided. Uh, so when he provides for them and teaches them about his provision in life so that they will have a story to tell about the provision of God, he sends manna and he says, I'm going to send twice as much on Friday and nothing on Sabbath. And those that went out to look for the manna on Sabbath... Moses was like, why are you going out to look for manna on Sabbath? I told you there wasn't going to be any. And so even though they had not been in contact with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob for 430 years and needed to be, as a whole nation, taught again about their God, God chooses to do it in a way that you could say was baby food. Was baby food. They live in the desert of sin, while they're waiting to go into the promised land. They endure a delay. Part of what I wanted to say today was the fact that I believe that we are living in another delay. We are living in a delay, but we are living 
with the fact that Jesus says, today, not tomorrow. Today. Today. Jesus, when he's talking to his, his people, tells them, today, if you hear my voice, don't harden your hearts as you did at Meribah and Massa, saying it would have been better if we had been back in Egypt. I don't know about how your week went last week. Some of you had some interesting things happen. Uh, others of you just had a regular boring week. You could say it was boring. But I don't know how many of you would say, you know what, I wish that it had been a worse week when I was in slavery. I wish that it had been a worse week when I couldn't pay my bills. I wish that it had been a, 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 a time when, when I thought that everything was good, but then I thought about how nice it would be to live in Santa Clarita, and I came to live in Santa Clarita, and it's really great, but I wish I was back where it wasn't. Did anybody, anybody say that this week? I, I don't think you did. But here we have a people who, because they don't get a little bit of food and a little bit of water, say to God, you know what, we wish, they say to Moses, we wish that you had left us in Egypt. We wish we could have died in Egypt. Now we say, these guys are crazy. But before you become too critical... Maybe you want to realize that by our actions, potentially, we say the same thing. By deciding that we are going to continue to live in a way that ignores the abundance of God in our lives, and where we depend on ourselves for our own support, and that our plans for the future are made not on whether or not it's something God wants us to do, but whether it's what we feel that we should be doing. That when we live like that, we are really no different than the children of Israel that were waiting for God to do something for them and decided that it was better that they had died back in Egypt. All because of the delay. Yeah, we've we've had a delay. I told you about I told you about the fact that we've had a delay uh, in, in, in in 1844. We had another delay in, in 1888. How many other times have there has there been a delay? I don't know. But after incorporating as a as a church, we have been preaching and we have been on this this journey down Mulberry Street For over 150 years, going on 170 years. 170 years. That's, that's four generations at least of people who live to a ripe old age of 70 plus. 170 years. So when I say to you, when, when your pastor says to you, hey guys, the word of today is today, not tomorrow. I, I, I hope it shakes you a little bit. I really do. Don't get me wrong. I'm into prophecy. But I believe, I believe that our emphasis on the future as Seventh-day Adventists has potentially, doesn't have to, you can change, it has robbed us of our present Just let that sink into your mind for a moment. Now you know why I talked to you earlier about family promise and what we're doing for people in the here and now. Because I believe, I believe that Jesus died on the cross and at that moment, the, 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 the fulfillment of prophecy of the one who would come was fulfilled. And that since then, his kingdom has been rolling forward even though, even though, the evil one has not disappeared. He knows that his time is short. And here you and I have been given life in the kingdom of God that is being usurped by the evil one. And we have the opportunity through the power of the Holy Spirit. We can't do it ourselves. We need to be empowered. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we have the opportunity to be living in the kingdom of God. I call it the first episode. 
I call it episode one. <coughs> Living in the kingdom of God because it belongs to him. It belongs to him. He won it back. And as Ellen tells us, that Adam was the first vicegerent, you could call him the chancellor of the earth, and that when he gave his crown away to the evil one, Jesus came back to this earth, and the evil one actually had the audacity to say, I will give you all of this if you bow down and worship me, as if he was king of the world, as if the world belonged to him. Such blasphemy, because the world never belonged to him. He only took over management of the world from Adam. Let's not forget that. I, I thank uh, Mrs. White for illuminating that particular piece. Satan has never been king of this world. He has always been the one who has taken away management. And now Jesus comes. He dies. He's buried. He's resurrected. And he becomes the second Adam. He now is the one who is the, not only the king of the world as God, but also the vicegerent. Our brother in behalf of all humanity. As we move forward, I believe that God is going to show us the way. Let's, let's think for a moment as we close of the Lord's Prayer. How many times does the, Lord, the Lord's Prayer talk about the future? Say it in your minds with me, or say it out loud. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy king. Are you going to ask him to have his kingdom be... Are, are you actually praying that you will be part of his kingdom? That it will come? And that when you act as if he is already king of this world, that when you tell your story about Mulberry Street, you can tell it with a bunch of things that are happening because you now see Mulberry Street with God's eyes. You see what is happening in the world from God's perspective. What does he say about today? One short verse, and give us our daily. Give us our today bread. Because just like the people of Israel, we are in this delay. We're, we're in the wilderness. But we're seventh day people. We honor the creator God. And the creator God, as we've said before, he says to us, I've got you. I've got you. I'll take care of you. Depend on me. That's the story that we can leave today and that we can tell our friends who are also living in this delay time. We serve a God who says today, Today is the day of salvation. Today I will take care of you. Don't worry about tomorrow. What did the text say today that we heard? I know it goes by very quickly and sometimes we don't take it in. Maybe we should read it five times and then maybe we'll think about it more. But it says, tomorrow has what? Enough trouble of its own. Let's not bother about tomorrow. Let's not bother about thinking of, of, of tomorrow. Let's, let's think about today. What will you do? What will you do today? I'm praying that you will invite Jesus into your heart. You'll invite him to take control of your life and to, that you will accept again the offer of salvation today. Amen? Amen. Amen.